Okay, let's get going. Thank you very much again for being here on time. Uh, as I said, my name is Paul Sims. I'm chairman of Cypher Pharma. I'm calling you today from London, and I'd like you to I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, which is called the Roadmap to a Value Model that Supports Breakthrough Innovation. Uh, and today's webinar is going to be uh, quite US centric rather than the more global events that we usually do. But we've still got uh, well over 600, I think possibly even 700 people signed up. So a healthy number demonstrating that this is a topic that a lot of people really care about. I personally believe that we're on something of an in inevitable path towards a more value based model. But of course, uh, we all have frustrations about perhaps how long it's taking us to get there. Uh, and even more frustratingly, it's not because of the lack of innovation itself. Uh, you know, the state of curative cell and gene therapies is looking very healthy, but the frustration as ever is down to the system, the acute need for some pricing innovation to get these medicines over the line into the hands of patients. And today we really want to tackle this head on. We want to really know how payers and government can balance cost constraints and what farmers' role is in actually helping that balancing act to happen. Uh, so we're going to get a lot of insights over the next hour or so. Um, we uh, are going to see um, what can be done today and, and where we're going to end up in the future. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that I've got a fantastic panel and you should be able to see their smiling faces looking at you right now. I'm just going to introduce each of these very quickly and then I'm going to hand over to Ulrich who is actually going to be our moderator for the, uh, for the session today. So Elizabeth, top left, she is the head of US market access and strategy at, uh, market access and strategy, uh, sorry, at uh, Bio Biogen. And um, she's actually been with Biogen since 2012. Her team is responsible for ensuring access strategy across marketed products and late stage pipeline. She also previously led the market access team for multiple sclerosis in Europe and Canada. Um, she's had four launch products and more than 40 reimbursement reassessments with Biogen in that role. Uh, she's also a doctor of health economics. She's also supported HTA and market access strategy, and she's worked at the Center of Medicare and Medicaid Services. So uh, absolutely fantastic that you can join us, Elizabeth. Thank you. Uh, underneath is Robert, and Robert is the vice president of U.S government relations at Pfizer. He brings almost two decades of experience across healthcare policy, health economics, government relations, medical affairs, and strategic planning. He's published and presented extensively on the impact of medicines and policies on cost and clinical outcomes, and he studied and published both clinical and policy-related economic analysis, including empirical data regarding emerging market payment mechanisms in the U.S. So interestingly, uh, yeah, it does has done some some very much sort of first in first in the field uh, work over the years, and uh, really pleased you could be with us also, Robert. Uh, on the right, you'll see Mike. Mike is the vice president of research for the National Pharmaceutical Council. Uh, he plays a key role in developing and delivering the NPC's portfolio of health policy and health outcomes projects. He's got 13 years of industry experience, both uh, pharma and payer. Uh, he's been a senior research manager at Evidera, where he designed and led a wide variety of both qualitative and quantitative studies across multiple healthcare industries and stakeholders, analyzing reimbursement and treatment patterns for drugs, biologicals, and even devices. And we have Ulrich, who I've already mentioned is going to be today's moderator. Uh, he is the head of U.S. Access and a senior director at uh, Analytica Laser, which is uh, Satara's evidence and access group. Um, he's got a dual background in business and public administration. He focuses on reimbursement and pricing issues, as well as activities on a political, legislative, and regulatory landscape to assess policy, dri policy drivers, enablers, and challenges to market access. He's a founder of many ventures. He's worked on go-to-market projects for more than 12 years. He's published two books in the policy field, as well as many articles, papers, reports, and posters around these critical managed care topics. And uh, the star in his the feather in his cap, of course, is that he used to be the US Managing Director of IFA Pharma, so also a good friend. Thank you so much, Ulrich, for stepping in and being moderator here today. So um, that's really um, it from, from me, uh, having introduced everybody. I'm going to hand over to Ulrich now. But what I would very much like you to um, just take note of the right-hand side of your screen where you should see a questions box. And uh, maybe you can write a little hello in there to make sure that, uh, that you're, so I know that you're actually listening, haven't fallen asleep already. Uh, and um, and uh, 
once you've uh, located that, okay, I can see some hellos. That's very reassuring. Um, once you've now you've located that, I would love you to be an active user of this questions box. It's really the only way to guarantee that your questions get answered. So please, I'd love to see from everybody here today at least one question, if not more, uh, and do ensure that you uh, uh, treat this more of a, a discussion, not simply a didactic type of session. Uh, we are recording the session. It will be available to you afterwards. You don't need to send me an email, um, and uh, you'll be able to re-listen, share it with your team, whatever you so wish afterwards. Okay. Handing over to Ulrich now, but thank you from me, and uh, I'll be back with you at the end of the webinar. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, and I, I think it may well be the first IFA Pharma webinar since you guys uh, uh, tied up with Reuters um, and having, That's uh, correct. as you alluded to, a small role in the company before. Um, I think all by it very briefly want to congratulate you, Paul. Um, I think that that's showing a great recognition of, of, of the work you've been doing at IFA Pharma, essentially uh, really transforming it as sort of that community of industry change makers that most of us uh, see in it today. Um, and I was thinking of other alumni of the IFA Pharma group, and, and uh, I think on, on many of the speaker side, we are counting a couple of industry C-suite executives. Um, so that's a distinction. Speaking of um, exceptional people, I am very happy to be joined by uh, such astute panelists as Elizabeth, Mike, and Robert. Um, you've heard their bio blurbs, and um, you, you, the experiences they'll have, you'll certainly come to appreciate over the next uh, hour. And actually, I think just staying on Thomson Reuters here for one more second, um, the company uses the byline, the answers company, uh, which I think is pretty clever uh, when you think about it. Um, now, good answers uh, necessitate good questions. Um, and so my job today is to perhaps provide some of the questions that may get, uh, get us a bit closer to the answers we, we need and we seek. Um, but as Paul said, that does not relieve you as the listeners are doing the exact same. So please ask away in the chat box and I'll make sure I get to the bottom of your inquiries and comments if indeed uh, you put them there. With respect to our topic of financing curative therapies um, today, um, good reliable answers um, are certainly in high demand. Simply put, it's a very easy question. How are we going to be able to afford future cures? Um, if innovation occurs every day in our labs, what's the innovation in terms of how we finance and how we pay for the move from bench to market? Uh, what are the models and what are the policies that will enable them? Um, that's the main topic of today's session. Uh, and we'll have some, some great research, uh, some great uh, uh, insights from NPC, from the National Pharmaceutical Council on that. Now, that's the future part, but there's also sort of a reality part to this conversation, and I hate to bring it up, but I'll bring it up very quickly here. If you look at the Gallup survey today uh, of industry sectors, 25 industry sectors ranked the pharmaceutical industry as the bottom lowest and most unfavorable, oil, gas, federal government, utilities, all above us. Uh, so that's where we are. Uh, that's where we are after probably a period of years where we've uh, seen more life-changing innovation um, more life-changing drugs than ever before approved by FDA. Um, and um, are we in the right place here? Uh, and if we're not, how do we get to the right place? Uh, that's exactly the topic and we'll tackle it. And without much further ado, uh, we're going to begin the learnings here today with Robert Popovian from Pfizer. Um, and that's really about the here and now. And if you, you know, like me, are sort of drowning in headlines and reports about yet another policy initiative in DC, uh, and actually a lot of states for that matter. Um, Robert is your man to give you some, some help and some answers. I've had the benefit of calling on in his insights for, for, for some time and to Dell, you'll enjoy his perceptive analysis as well. And he's going to start us off with a one slide primer on the facts, the fads, and the future of pharmaceutical policy in the US in the near term. So Robert, please take it away. We'll bring up your slide now and, and um, you've got the floor. Thank you, Ehrlich, and thank you for iPerpharma as well as Paul for leading this important discussion. So as Ehrlich uh, sort of alluded to, we are in the cusp of a great deal of innovation and exciting innovation that's coming out, but there's a lot of questions about how do we finance these innovation and what are the policies that we can implement to really help uh, patients access those medicines. Uh, but we are here now, right, with regards to what is going on both in the D Washington, D.C., here in Washington, D.C., as well as the state houses regarding some of the 
policy and legislative proposals that are being sort of brought forth to quote unquote manage drug spending. Some of them are positive, many of them are negative. So we'll go through them and also uh, try to give you an idea of where they stand as well as the, what is the possibility and which ones can be the most disruptive to the sort of the innovation cycle and the innovation investment by pharmaceutical industry. So let's start with, with the one that has pretty much been on the, I would say, uh, on the horizon for the last almost two decades. Uh, which is importation of medicines from foreign countries into U.S. Um, this issue has been on the docket since the mid-2000s, but really it took off in the last year or so when several states again reignited with passage of laws specifically related to importation. The most important state, which is a, was the bellwether, was Florida. And the reason it's important in Florida is because Florida, unlike the other states that have passed uh, importation legislation previously or even this year, is a Republican-controlled state. That means it has a Republican uh, legislation, legislators, controlled legislators, uh, as well as a governor who happens to be Republican. So with that said, uh, the President Trump has signaled that he is very favorable to the importation law that passed in Florida and has asked the Health and Human Services to start development of regulations for safe importation of medicines into the United States. We're in the midst of developing those regulations. Some of them have been proposed and they're looking for comments back from stakeholders. And I think we're well on our way to developing regulations that will be released relatively soon by the administration about safe importation of medicines as it relates to the state states that pass these laws and are allowed by, because it's a state-by-state -state initiative by the Health and Human Services to allow importation of medicines from foreign countries. Uh, international reference pricing, this is probably one of the areas that initially was looked upon as an issue that needs to be dealt with with regards to pricing of medicines in OECD countries, in developed countries. Uh, the issue being that, uh, you know, we would like to see other countries pick up some of the pricing pressures that we feel in the U.S. marketplace. However, the international price reference pricing is not really the answer that we were looking for, which was to really allow through trade policy to sort of uh, mitigate the increased pricing pressures that we see in the U.S. International reference pricing is basically, in a nutshell, uh, references or uh, reference pricing to several countries with regards to infusion drugs that are currently administered uh, in, through the Medicare Part B, as in BOY program. It's important to note that though international reference pricing has also been seen in other parts of legislation, specifically the uh, Health Res uh, HR3, which is the also known as the Pelosi bill with regards to drug pricing. And you will hear more about international reference pricing. I think it's the one that is the most disruptive if, if it's passed in this, how it would basically um, impact uh, research and development and pharmaceutical companies in the US and, and, and abroad, not just for the US company. Inflation cap, which is basically uh, a policy that's been forwarded through a couple of both the Senate finance bill as well as the HR3 again. This has to do that if pharma companies increase uh, the, their prices above the inflation rate in the U.S., they have to pay a penalty and have to pay, pay it back in uh, sort of a concession back to the government. This is something that we have had for in the Medicaid program for several decades now, um, which is called the CPI guarantee. Uh, which they want to now institute for Medicare and, and government run, other government run programs. Access to biosimilars. This is, there's three active bills in the House <clears throat> introduced that will incentivize physicians to use more biosimilars, will lower out of pocket costs for patients who use biosimilars, as well as reward um, managed care health plans such uh, that work uh, with. Uh, and the star ratings, uh, sort of, they 
they provide them the impetus to adopt biosimilars in their plants, and therefore they will get higher star ratings uh, through the uh, through the regulatory body of the NCQA. The government drug price negotiation, or also called arbitration, it's something that again been, has been on the docket for a while since the passage of Medicare Part D program in mid 2000s. Uh, this is when the government will start negotiating for prices, but the, the difficulty being not only that, you know, it's uh, not something we want to get into because drug negotiation does impact access to medicines. We've seen that in different government programs that directly negotiate with pharma companies. But also that there's the impetus of some of the legislation we've seen is that this will spill over into the private sector. And in fact, the government price setting will then take hold in the private sector as well. There's two, the next two bullets are Medicare Part D out-of-pocket cap and Medicare Part D redesign. This is very important because everybody agrees, even though the Medicare Part D is probably the model government program run in this country, with regards to its success, that there is there needs to be some modernization of the program, just because when it was instituted in the mid 2000s, we didn't have as many specialty medicines. The benefit designs were very different, uh, where it used to be primarily co-payments or flat fee for patients who were paying out of pocket. What we're seeing in benefit designs now is more specialty uh, or uh, medicines where they are bound with coinsurance or we have seen deductible plans, which is another problem. So uh, Medicare Part D is also the only program, uh, including in the private sector, that doesn't have a cap for patient out-of-pocket costs. So this is important. So there's a redesign effort as well as uh, putting a cap in out-of-pocket costs for patients. Pass-through of rebates. Uh, this is something that initially was introduced earlier this year uh, to by the so-called HHS uh, rebate rule, uh, which was subsequently withdrawn in July. But now there's an effort again by Congress to introduce passage of uh, concessions at the point of sale uh, to patients uh, in form when the concessions are in form of rebates or fees and so on and so forth. Um, there's uh, definitely a uh, effort both led by the Senate Finance as well as the House members to be able to do this. This is important because really, if you want to lower out-of-pocket costs for patients, uh, we should do what we do for every other segment of the healthcare system in the United States, which is when a patient walks into a dentist's office or a physician's office or a hospital or an optometrist, their coinsurance or their deductible is based upon a negotiated price that's been done on their behalf by that insurer or that pharmacy benefit manager. Pharmaceuticals are the only segment of healthcare where concessions that have been sort of garnered on behalf of the patient are not passed through to the patient at the point of sale. So this is another thing that we're trying to do. PBM reform. Uh, this is regarding a regulation of PBMs in the state level specifically, uh, with more transparency passage of, uh, you know, states are looking into licensing them, looking into how much of the rebates are they keeping or passing it back onto the plan sponsor. Um, the last next one is transparency. We've seen several transparency bills passed in the United States. Uh, it's a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag with regards to they are very cumbersome to uh, to work with and to uh, be able to comply with. But the benefit is that a lot of these transparency reports now that are coming out are really helping uh, to uh, to sort of put more emphasis in what pharmaceutical costs are in the United States. Most of them are showing that pharmaceuticals consume between 10 and 18 percent of the healthcare budget depending on the type of a payer. This is something that the industry has been saying for a very long time. And you would hear the rhetoric from the insurers and the pharmacy benefit managers that the percentage was more closer to 20 and 25% and 30% in some cases. So these reports actually have helped uh, sort of uh, bring back our two decade old messaging that pharmaceuticals are a small part of the healthcare budget between 10 and 14%, which is what we're seeing with these transparency reports from various states coming out. Pricing commissions, these are, uh, we've seen this com uh, these commissions, one of them that is already instituted in the state of Maryland. 
This is basically setting rates for pharmaceuticals. Uh, it's another form of arbitration or price control. Um, I think we're going to see this in several other states coming up. And lastly, I put down here anti-kickback and Stark Law reform, which was introduced relatively, I think, I believe last week or a week before. This has to do more with regards to the physician behavior and when they're taking on risk and whether or not they can, uh, you know, let's change the star clause as well as anti-kickback rules. The administration has yet to put out, and they specifically made a point that these are not about pharmaceutical value-based contracting or value-based pricing agreements. Uh, the administration is still thinking through how to address those issues with regards to anti-kickback statutes as well as Medicaid best price. And they, they are still unclear when that regulation will come out to address those things. With no further ado, I could say, say to you that all of these rules, federal legislation, regulations are something that most will happen or may happen. The, the potential, I believe that importation has a very high, high probability because I believe that with the HHS now for the first time signing off and trying to develop rules about importation, it will happen. The PBM reform and transparency laws in the states are ongoing. Uh, I believe the most disruptive ones that we can see are things like international reference pricing or any kind of reference pricing, government price drug negotiation, and pricing commissions because they directly impact how we're able to price our medicines and bring medicines into the market. Without any further ado, I will stop and uh, take it back to Ehrlich. Uh, thanks a lot, Robert. Uh, a, a, a long, important, and in many ways daunting list. Um, now, one of the questions that I had for you, you, you preempted in saying, um, now, a lot of the legislation we look at um, bundled a couple of these uh, uh, parts, right? Um, uh, the Pelosi bill does, uh, uh, Grassley Wyden does. Um, now, in terms of just passage uh, of these bundles, um, there's been a lot of talk, uh, if you're in the U.S., about Grassley Wyden. They've done the editorial a couple of days ago. And basically, right, what they're saying is it's, it's a consensus bill. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not an anti-pharma bill. Um, we're going to, you know, improve part, part D a bit, um, we'll, um, but you guys can keep innovating. Um, Robert, you're, you're sort of a pretty astute observer of the political processes behind that. Um, why, why is that? Why is there a chance that this is not going to get into law. If the president needs a result on, on drug pricing, he is not going to go with Pelosi. Republicans seem to be co-sponsoring it and supporting most of it. Um, Trump wants the Senate. Uh, I think he's even said Senate Act, do something, give me something. Um, how, how is this going to shape out? Um, do, you, do you think there's a strong likelihood that it actually might become law? So yeah, so this is, this is where politics gets really interesting, right? So um, the widen Grassley bill, bill that you refer to, it is a mixed bag. It has some very bad stuff in it. It does have international reference pricing as well as, uh, you know, some type of uh, inflation cap uh, uh, legislation, but it does have a redesign of Part D as well as out-of-pocket cap for Part D. So you're absolutely correct. And also some PBM reform stuff with regards to PBM transparency. Our view is that, um, uh, you know, we can work uh, with Senator Wyden and Senator Grassley to sort of address the international price reference pricing inflation cap issues in there. Um, I think if we can address those two issues, I think there's a possibility that will pass. Now, Senator Grassley is on the record saying that because of the calendar, the way it sets up for the rest of the year, because, you know, it's not like they work every single day until the end of the calendar year. Uh, that he doesn't foresee this legislation moving forward this year, that it will be probably be in 2020. Now, having said that, uh, you never know what's going to happen at the end of the year. And the reason I'm saying this is because there are certain legislation that needs to pass at the end of the year, something like a continuing resolution that keeps the government open. So you don't know what bits and parts of this legislation can be put in there in a bill that is a must pass, right? Because you really need to keep the government open. Nobody wants the government shut down and it will go through then. We've seen this two years ago, what happened with the donut hole, where a lot of the responsibility with payment of the donut hole was transferred over to pharma. So that's the risk. We believe that there will be something happening. Senator Grassley says that he doesn't foresee it happening this year, that it's more 2020. However, um, 
there may be a risk at the end of the year with these things. I think the two things I would say in the gradually widened bill that really is dangerous for pharma is the international reference pricing and the inflation cap issue. Uh, I think those two things are something that needs to be addressed before it will, uh, I believe that pharma can fully sign off on it. All right. Um, I see a couple of questions coming in on these initiatives. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll move on to the uh, next presentation very soon. If you still have questions, do put them in. Um, I'm summarizing two of them here, and, and they're pertaining to two initiatives. Um, one is, uh, what is the pharma view on drug importation? Um, Robert is saying, well, historically, we could resist that, right? Because we could just choose not to go into certain countries. Uh, quite different if the U.S. is the market, right? So um, there's that question, and then there's the question, a question here from, from, from uh, Arvind about uh, 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 the need to comment a little from the panel on fiduciary PBM option. Um, and I don't know who wants to take that, but, but I, from a general manufacturer point of view, I add one more question to those two. How do you prepare for that? Um, there's the policy aspects that Robert has talked about, uh, but, but you know, how do you, how do you uh, get ready for, for that? Do you start modeling the impact of this? Uh, I'd be curious to see what our uh, what what is there from a pharma perspective to prepare for this environment. I mean, I, I from a manufacturer perspective, I would say that probably most manufacturers, or if not all, um, are modeling this out and seeing what the impact would be of the different elements of this proposed legislation across the across the bills. Um, and they're and they're pretty extreme in some cases. You know, as Robert previously said, the IPI and the inflation cap really are the most destructive to the industry. Right, right. Actually, Robert's texting me. I misconstrued his question. I didn't mean to do that. He's saying, "What if we just uh, uh, restricted supply in Canada? Then there could not be importation." Yeah. So uh, I think the importation, or like, I think the importation issue is important because we can restrict access of medicines into Canada. So then what you will, you will end up happening is that you're then importing drugs from unknown countries because we know how much we supply Canada and we supply other countries and you can easily restrict that. The only thing that will stop that is that what we're seeing in certain European OECD countries is pal parallel trade, right? Where they're shipping the medicines to and selling them to other OECD countries. All right. And just to add um, to that, I mean, one of the issues with parallel trade, you know, as we've seen um, is is the stockouts when certain countries do sell their or hospitals will be selling their um, supplies to another country for a higher rate. Um, and so, you know, this would have an impact on Canada or any other market that is importing drugs into the United States. Um, and that's not to mention any potential safety concerns because it's unclear that you're actually getting marketed product. Um, most companies are testing this when they see product coming in. If it's not pre-flagged parallel trade uh, product that has, um, that is to some degree regulated in Europe. Excellent. Thanks, Elizabeth. Before we go to the next presentation and keep the questions coming, we'll ask them in the next period. Um, I want to get one poll question up. And that's question number one. Um, we would love for the panel uh, to engage uh, on the following question. Um, one of the things that got recently polled and now gets, uh, as Robert said, made potentially in Congress reintroduced is the idea that the system of rebates between pharma and payers uh, could be eliminated. At least that's how the question is stated here. If you had to indicate your support, how would you support? Would you support that very strongly? Would you support that somewhat strongly, neutrally, weak, somewhat weak, or very weak? Please, um, I'll give you uh, uh, another 30 seconds to vote on this question. Um, use the panel and indicate, would you support uh, essentially uh, getting rid of uh, what Scott Gottlieb, Gottlieb uh, called, I think, the uh, Kabuki theater of, of rebating and, and the U.S. insurance system. Uh, I don't know how many questions we, we see coming in here. I will just get the results, but maybe leave it in for another 10 seconds. Yep, we've got about a third of people voted so far, so please get your votes in. Um, I'll do a little countdown, shall I? This is Paul, by the way. Uh, five, four, three, Two, one. Thank you very much to all of you who voted. Here are the results. All right. On balance, pharma seems to be supportive of that notion here, with uh, over 
um, saying uh, they, they might lend support to that policy. Um, is that indeed what you're hearing, uh, uh, Robert, from, from most of the pharmaceutical companies? Uh, let me, I, I would say, so I would say it's very strong and I will give you, uh, I'm somewhat strong, I will give you what Pfizer's position was on the HHS rule. We supported the uh, removal of the anti-kickback statute uh, from Medicare. We also were very clear that if similar legislation which Senator Braun introduced happened in the private sector that in fact, I know my, my CEO said that then that will impact the retail prices and in fact, we will reduce our retail prices if that happens. Uh, the only place we believe that rebates can have a role in is the topic that we're discussing today, which is value-based agreements that we left open that portion that perhaps rebating can still be used. But one thing I will remind everyone on the phone here, it's not all about rebates and that's important to note. It's, it's everything, it's all the concessions that we give, which uh, in the United States, total concessions that goes back to the payer, or whatever the insurers and the PBMs are, uh, are close to over $160 billion, which is about 30 to 40% of the spend of how much we spend on drugs, both on the retail and uh, non-retail segment of pharmaceutical. So that's, that's a significant amount of money that gets lost in the supply chain. And we believe that by fixing the rebate issue, you also do other things, which is sort of help uh, like normalize and incentivize for pharma companies to bring out lower price alternatives into the market and not be asked by insurers and PBMs to go back, price your drug higher, and give me more rebates, which creates the bad incentives of increasing your retail price over and over and over again. So that is the position of Pfizer with regards to the rebate reform. Excellent. I think you, you, you hinted there that um, a, a huge part of our conversation today is also um, within this sort of context that we are in, we also have the question of financing future cures. Um, you know, um, most of the initiatives that you mentioned there aren't actually tackling that. So I want to hand over to Mike from the National Pharmaceutical Council to help us understand. We have this this wave of potential cures coming. Um, how can we afford to pay for them? Uh, and Mike has done some very very interesting research with payers onto some of the innovative models uh, that we might want to suggest uh, could be a way out. Um, with that. Uh, Mike, uh, your presentation, please take the floor. Thank you, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I, I definitely want to take us down from the broad policy level down to more of the better characterizing the nature of the, the payment and affordability challenges with breakthrough innovation and really begin to characterize some of the solutions. Next. So concern about rising health spend is not new, as you can see from the headlines, which go back here 50 years. Um, despite the concern, the health spend has continued to rise over the last 50 years, and now is near about 18% of GDP. Next. Similar to rising health spend, there has been a continual focus on drugs, often without other areas of spend discussed. This was one of the primary motivating factors in NPC undertaking a broad spending initiative that includes both research and various partnerships. Next. So the full health spending story is often much more complex than what is uh, represented. To highlight this point, I wanted to share a kind of several top line findings of an NPC study that was published in Health Affairs earlier this year. In this research, we looked at the top seven causes of death and disability from 1995. Uh, we selected these conditions using uh, dollies. And what we found is that, you know, many health spending analysis don't really make any adjustments for prevalence and often are just focused on the health cost side of the equation without any real consideration for changes in outcomes. So given how that's typically done, you can see this in the top row, which showed how costs changed in these seven conditions over 20 years. And you can see that that cost really, total cost increased significantly. Many studies and many analysis and policy thoughts would really stop with that conclusion. But we really wanted to get a better understanding of what was really driving spending changes once you adjust for uh, prevalence and outcomes. 
In contrast to more simplistic analysis, what we find is that in four of the conditions actually had costs on a per patient basis go down, along with outcome improvements. Two of the three conditions with cost increases had improved outcomes, making cost per reduced dolly highly cost effective. This really highlights the need to dig deeper into the issues to get an accurate understanding of what the real problem is. Next. This is one reason why MPC started the Going Below the Surface initiative, which is a research first endeavor dedicated to unearthing and examining the drivers of healthcare spending in the United States and convening a multi stakeholder discussion to better understand uh, you know, what we receive for these investments. Today, we have about 22 stakeholders in the Going Below the Surface forum including patients, payers, providers, policymakers, biopharmaceutical companies, and academics. So with that background context, uh, next please, I want to shift more to the, the breakthrough therapies. Um, in the last five years, the U.S. has seen several transformative therapies enter the market, including hepatitis C, CAR T, and we now have several uh, gene therapies on the market. The number and types of this these therapies are expected to grow significantly over the next five years, which has amplified some of the uh, overall affordability concerns that exist in public uh, discussion domain. So a question you know, really to consider is, are these concerns justified, and are there payment mechanisms that really can address these affordability issues? Next. To answer this question, the MIT New Digs uh, financing of Cures project in the United States, which if you're not familiar with it, it's a great project. I encourage people to get involved. They did a, basically a forecast of curative and durable gene therapies coming to the market. Uh, and they did this forecast based on a detailed analysis of clinical trial data. It was really a deep dive. And basically what they conclude in their analysis is that 45 cure, they expect about 45 curative therapies to enter the market by the end of 2029. So that translates really, if you look at the number of patients treated, that really translates um, into a small percentage. Essentially by 2024, the cumulative number of patients is less than two tenths of a percent. Now, assuming that each of these therapies costs about a million dollars uh, per treatment, that translates into less than 1% of the national health expenditures for, uh, predicted by CMS in 2027. So in terms of dollars, the total impact of these breakthrough innovations will likely be manageable and is not as really big as people have put out there. Next. Next. So, so, but that doesn't, just because the total dollars aren't problematic, that doesn't mean that there aren't legitimate uh, affordability concerns that exist. First, many of these therapies will have performance uncertainties, especially regarding their durability over the long term. And then second, how the G these curative therapies impact the market really will be asymmetric, and this is really an important point to understand. And there are two primary reasons for this. First, it's financial. You know, the impact of a 500,000 or a million dollar therapy is much greater on a plan with 10,000 or 50,000 lives than a plan that has 10 million lives. Also, we, we need to remember that a significant portion of the market is self-insured employers, which have smaller numbers of insured lives. The second challenge is operational. Many of these therapies are targeting orphan to ultra-orphan conditions. Given the small patient populations, the facilities offering treatment are likely to be limited. All of this is to say it's really going to take highly specialized knowledge to manage these therapies. Putting it all together, it means that curative durable therapies are likely to have a higher impact on the smaller commercial payers, the self-insured employers, Medicaid and Medicare, Medicare Advantage plans, rather than your larger commercial plans and Medicare fee-for-service. Next. However, there are a variety of solutions to these problems, both the financial and operational challenges that I just highlighted. Um, first, 
an important point though to understand is there's not a one size fits all approach. Uh, it's all of these tools that you see in the slide here have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, some of the potential tools such as reinsurance or stop loss from the employer side and risk pooling are available today, while other newer instruments such as performance-based annuities and something called an orphan benefit reinsurer manager, or ORBM, which I'll explain in a few minutes, are things that don't really adequately exist in today's market. So I want to dig a little deeper into the milestone-based contracts, the performance-based annuities, and the orphan benefit reinsurer manager concept. Next. So basically, a milestone-based contract helps the payer to manage potential performance risk associated with the therapy. The figure illustrates it assumes an upfront payment by a payer to the developer for the agreed price of the medicine. The developer is then contractually obligated to provide a refund for non-performance if specific milestones or outcomes are not met. So really, these, these instruments are really designed to address the performance uncertainty. The key challenge here is you have to have the infrastructure uh, to collect the data and measure it. And then two, probably equally important, is you have to be able to, to agree on a set of me measurable outcomes, which can be quite challenging depending on the disease state. Next. Next, we have a performance-based annuity, which helps payers manage both potential performance risk associated with the therapy, and it also spreads the cost of the therapy over time, thus smoothing payment timing, uh, which is one of the primary financial challenges here. In addition, it reflects the therapy performance is established over a greater period than one year, and thus a contract term of greater than one year. Uh, we also have installment payments, which are basically similar to annuity performance-based annuities minus the performance piece. Next, and you've seen that offered somewhat in the market. The final concept is something called an orphan reinsurer and benefit manager, and this is really targeted towards those smaller payers, uh, self-insured employers that I mentioned earlier. So, what exactly is this ORBM? Well, the let me begin by saying that the ORBM is actually not a novel concept. It really builds on existing concepts in the marketplace. Think about the behavioral health carve-outs and organ transplant carve-outs. Essentially, the services are managed by a third party, and that third party may provide uh, of any of the following services, performing network contracting, performing clinical management, including patient care coordination, and then they also bear the financial risk. In today's world, these third parties perform any or all of these services. And from the patient perspective, and ideally all of these services are provided in the background and it should be rather a seamless process for them. The ORBM will really function in much the same way in terms of interfacing with patients, payers, the developer, and the provider. So I want to conclude with highlighting the fact that significant challenges exist to the implementation of these novel payment approaches. Next, please. First, performance-based contracts and annuities require the ability to track patients and their outcomes. We all know this is challenging because patients often switch insurers, typically three years or less. Second, many self-insured employers have stop-loss insurance. So what is the impact of a multi-year milestone contract or an annuity on stop loss? Third, there are a large number of regulatory hurdles in place with uh, you know, Medicaid best price really being the poster child. But there's also less cited but equally important regulatory challenges really occur at the state level. And also there are a series of revenue and accounting rules which can prevent or undermine the value of doing these approaches in the first place. It is critical that these issues get addressed so that patients can get the access to these high value therapies. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Uh, that's, that's really insightful. And I, I wanna follow up on this with a poll, actually a poll question to the audience, um, and that's number two, um, and get everyone a little engaged. Thanks a lot for your questions, keep them coming. Now, this is a question to the audience. From what you just heard, what Mike outlined there, which of the following reimbursement models of the future 
would you be most willing to embrace as a manufacturer? If you're a consultant, think of your client. What from the manufacturer side would be, would be of those, if you had to choose one, the one you'd most embrace? Is it population risk pooling? Is it those milestone-based contracts in the short term or those mile, uh, milestone-based contracts in the long term? Um, the annuity payment, but with the performance guarantee, or basically the same, but without the performance guarantee as in the installment uh, payments over time. Um, what's the vote here? I'll give it probably another minute uh, while everyone's reflecting on that. Yeah, we've got about 40% of people voted so far, so please do get those votes in so we can close it and continue the conversation. Not much time left. Okay, uh, I think I'll give someone, it three more seconds. Some, Lorna is saying there should really be an option that says none. <laughs> we, we none. It to, to <laughs> well, maybe you can abstain. That. We'll let you abstain if you wish. <laughs> okay, uh, I've got just over half people voted. I'll hold it open another three seconds. Three, two, one. Thank you very much, everybody. Let's have a look. All right, um, Mike, if you look at these answers here, we have, uh, we have very few people for population risk pooling, um, installments over uh, a time, also less people. Actually, annuities with performance guarantee is, is, is the most voted one, uh, one third of the respondents uh, selecting that. Um, and close second are these milestone-based contract over, contracts over a long time. Now, Mike, if you look at this and what you hear from the payer side, how, how does that match up? I think it matches up pretty well. I mean, the, the majority consensus is that, you know, we're talking five years or less. In general, the, in the majority of time, we're actually talking three years or less. So the time horizon we're really talking about doing either milestone-based contract or annuity payments is really midterm, not really long-term. And so what you're seeing here uh, is pretty consistent with what I've heard across the board with payers, but also with developers. Excellent. And now um, I would love to get sort of the the, the, the manufacturer voice in uh, uh, Elizabeth back to back to you. Um, are you guys discussing any of this, or uh, you know, do you hear your colleagues at industry conferences being you know um, in, in offside chats excited about some of, some of this? Do you do you see some future models in what what we've what we've seen here come out of uh, NPC and and um, MIT? Um, yeah, so I'm obviously Biogen's a member of both um, NPC and MIT New Digs. Um, so we're actively involved in, with both of those groups. And these are options that we're constantly exploring and trying to better understand, you know, one, if they are feasible to implement and how we would do that. I also think another piece that we need to remember is what is our customer, what's the payer perspective and their willingness to accept one of these um, types of offerings. When we think about it, or when I think from the manufacturer perspective, we think about it, there's the one side of what we need, but the other side is what problem are we trying to solve for the customer? And Mike brought up a really interesting point that it really isn't a one size fits all approach. And so when we talk about these new um, uh, therapies coming to market, and the impact you know, on the large commercial pay payers potentially being lower, so also with Medicare versus the smaller payers, we need to come up with potential solutions for everybody. And in every case, it might uh, be widely different or you know, minorly, minorly different, but everything involves a ton of work on the manufacturer side. Um, so we spend a lot of time internally exploring what we do, what we would like to do, um, and the feasibility and simultaneously we'll be taking it out to our customers to see what their interests are and what would be feasible on their side. Um, one thing that I think is really important is to make sure that there is some sort of alignment internally before going out externally. Um, I think it makes the whole process go faster because even once both parties eventually meet agreement, it still takes a ton of work internally um, to to actually lift some of these agreements off the ground. Um, and as both um, Robert and Mike uh, previously mentioned, there's a ton of 
these legal limitations um, that make these really challenging. And so we have to be considering um, the logistics of each side. One of the options there that was mentioned was looking at performance um, or you know anchoring on specific outcomes. And I think that you know companies very much would like to do this because we believe in the value that our products bring to the market. Um, but one of the real challenges in my experience, and I think really broadly across manufacturers, is where are you going to get the data to do that? Of course, there's you know limitations with the anti-kickback statutes and who are, you know you can't pay somebody to collect the data. So how will that be implemented? Um, from a payer perspective, often you know they're looking to match what's in the clinical trial, but the clinical trial outcomes um, and what the regulatory uh, side of the equation anchored on isn't what's actually captured in clinical practice today. So you simultaneously have to make that work and figure out how that could work or determine is this something that could be captured in claims data. But claims data, of course, is not as detailed as some of the electronic health record or registry data is. Excellent. And Elizabeth, but one of the things we discussed in the in the chat just prior to, to, to this conversation was that you had the European and the US perspective. Uh, on you know on on confronting some of these challenges, and uh, I want to get the last poll question in, and then have everyone comment on it. That's question number three. Um, one of the uh, one of the, the the initiatives that has often been proposed um, is the uh, uh, creation of a of an HDA body in the U.S. Right, um, and in many ways uh, the organization uh, called ICER um, is seen as such uh, um, uh, institution. Um, now, it isn't officially mandated to, to do that by a policy, but if there was a policy, and this is the question to everyone, if there was a policy institute, an official HDA body, that would, you know, assess these questions and, and sort of adjudicate drug pricing via quality-based cost-effectiveness analysis, how would you feel about that? Would you support that very strongly? Would you somewhat support that? Would you be neutral on it, somewhat uh, less or very weak uh, uh, in your support for an official HDA body that uses quality-based uh, CEA. Um, I'll leave it up for another 30 uh, uh, seconds. Are we getting people voting? Yeah, we're getting some good. Yeah, we've got some good votes coming in on this. Uh, keep them coming. Uh, I'll give you another few seconds and some interesting results coming through as well, which we're about to reveal. So five, four, three, two, one. Thank you very much. Okay. I think you'll find this quite interesting. Here we go. That is indeed very interesting. We have a majority of respondents supporting uh, the advent of an, of an HDA buddy. Robert, what did you make of that? That's very interesting because I think uh, I will give you Pfizer's opinion about this. And we believe strongly that cost analysis should be part of the discussion. Uh, but we uh, strongly also support that it should not be the sole arbiter of uh, decision making with regards to coverage, right? It should not be a binary decision where a cost per quality number will dictate coverage of the medicine. And that there should be multiple data points that are used to determine uh, the coverage of that medicine at what level for cer certain patients to make it much more patient-centric. Um, and the other thing that we believe in is that, look, um, I'm an economist, so I know I've done these modeling in my life. It's very subjective. And just to think about that a single entity that does not have a government mandate, does not publish its information in peer-reviewed journals, does not follow certain guidelines that are well-established with regards to analysis is going to be the only entity that is going to be used to judge the value of the medicine, I think that's not going to happen in the U.S. I, I think the U.S. is going to have multiple uh, type of uh, endeavors where patients are going to be able to access their medicines. Uh, All right. Economic right. analysis. Right, right, absolutely. I, I want to get Elizabeth in there. Uh, um, I've got about 30 uh, uh, to 40 seconds left. Elizabeth, you're the health economist also, and you've been in Europe. You've seen these types of analyses. If you had one piece of advice, 
for those who might actually look at the survey like that uh, and might have thinking instituting of that in DC, what would be the advice that you would give them if they were to uh, go on to this path of creating an HDA? Um, I would say be careful what you wish for. I mean, if you look over in Europe, you know, to date, there have been very, very few um, unified um, joint HTA assessments, um, and there's and there's there's a reason for that. Um, and you know, in the end, you have this one assessment and one number, and that number is as good as the available data you have to put in that model. Um, and so that can make or break access to innovative therapies for patients. And so I would be very cautious in entering into something that will um, produce an outcome like that when really, you know, from my perspective and the Biogen perspective is the value framework um, or the, the cost effectiveness is just one part of the total assessment. Um, and currently, as these different um, different HTA bodies, you know, are set up, they all are a little bit different and they're not unified. And um, there's there, there's there's different amounts of effort, but it, it's really challenging. Um, and so we think that their much more holistic picture um, and model is required to capture the full value that these uh, treatments bring to society and the patients. Excellent, thank you. And I'm getting a lot of audience feedback. This is, this, this is Mike. One other, one other thing I would say too is, you know, especially with these transformative therapies, there's a lot of uncertainty up front. So if you're relying on your decision to cover or not cover based on that single upfront measure, you're going to end up not providing access to a lot of these therapies. And that's especially where these new payment techniques play, can play a key role. Instead of having to manage and bundle that certainty to a single number, you can basically effectively share that risk over time and right. um, you know, basically provides more flexibility to the system. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, I was just going to say, I get a lot of feedback here on the chatter of people saying no supporting uh, HTA have not gone for a nicer review. I can second that from experience. Thanks a lot for the participation. Participation is everything. Engagement matters. And uh, with about a minute left, I'm handing over to uh, I Pharma Chairman Paul Sims to give a call to action in terms of engagement, Paul. <laughs> well, I think it's certainly true that we could continue this conversation another hour, if not two more. Uh, and uh, obviously, I'm hugely grateful to each of you for making that happen. Um, but if indeed you do want to continue the conversation, then I would recommend that you let me just get there, um, take a quick look at uh, this event. This is happening in April next year. This is um, uh, part of our larger IFAMA Philadelphia conference, which has uh, several tracks now for, for really uh, many different audiences, but one of the key audiences, of course, is access. We also have another track on real-world evidence, another on medical affairs. Uh, and this is um, uh, a meeting which many industry leaders attend, and uh, indeed uh, many payers and stakeholders attend as well. Uh, and uh, the fact that it's so cross-functional means that we really can not just dig into the detail on the issues, but also the big picture stuff about indeed where our industry needs to be going generally, how we're going to improve the sort of reputation and relationships that we actually need in order to actually be able to move the needle on the sort of conversation we've been having today. So I'd love to see a few of you there. Um, I certainly will be in April next year. Have a look at the website if you want to know more. Uh, right, uh, we're pretty much uh, on time. So I'm going to say thank you once again. Um, thank you to Ulrich as well for your excellent moderation skills actually showing me up there. So thank you for that. Uh, and um, uh, indeed, it's been an absolute pleasure to host this conversation. Um, really, um, there are I don't know if we've, 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 we've certainly given a lot of answers, but at the same time, there are even more questions arising uh, with this kind of conversation. I'm going to hold this uh, webinar open for two or three minutes. I can see that we've still got um, a decent number of people on the line. Please just write into the Q&A box any messages of thanks uh, or any suggestions that you want to put forward to uh, what we need to cover, how we need to progress this conversation uh, in, in another session. So do please um, share all if you can. I'll hold it open for two more minutes, as I say. Thanks again to everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy your weekends. Uh, and I hope that uh, you can find some resolution to this very important issue in due course. Thanks so much.